The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. You must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report. A sunny Friday here in Southern California. We're going to talk NBA today. Coming up in a little bit, Mark Stein from ESPN.com. And my buddy House from nowhere. But first... A guy who is getting uh, getting death threats from Laker fans right now. I'm sure he's in the Subway Fresh Tech Hotline. ESPN.com's own Henry Abbott. What's happening? How are you, Bill? So you wrote the column that I've always wanted to write, but have always been afraid to because people think I'm a Kobe hater. And you just you just you just filleted that crunch time myth that he's the guy that you want with the final shot in a big game, and you say no. Explain yourself. I mean, first I get why people say that because we've seen him make so many tough shots so many times and that just gets emblazoned in your brain, right? But, but the fact is, you know, Stat Geeks have been trotting out numbers for years now showing that he takes more shots than anybody and misses a lot of them. Now, that convinces some people, but not very many. So I looked a little harder and, and found my favorite little thing here is over his 15-year career, the Lakers have the best offense in the NBA they score 109 points per 100 possessions, which is amazing. Yeah. In crunch time, they score 82 points per 100 possessions, which is you know, not just a measure of crunch time. Every team gets worse in crunch time, but they come back from first you know, best offense in the NBA to 11th best offense. Now, what happens for the Lakers in crunch time is they stop using the amazing triangle that gets them the best offense in the NBA, and they start using Kobe time, where there's this other game which involves you know, broken plays and isolations and Kobe going against double teams and, and you know, taking very, very difficult shots. And so, yeah, if you're going to take those tough shots, he probably is the best guy. But you don't have to take those tough shots, and he's not good. He's too selfish. He's too much of a ball hog. And so the Lakers actually end up being an average crunch time team, even though they have the personnel to be the best offensive team. I call it the hero complex. Yeah, absolutely. And, we, and we've seen it post-Jordan. And we saw for years and years with Paul Pierce in Boston. These guys, they you know, they want to be in Sports Center. They want to make the big shot. They want to now nowadays they want to be in the YouTube clip. But in, over the last few years, a site, when did 82games.com start? Uh, like about be, four years ago. I think it's even more like six or seven. Yeah, I don't I don't remember really knowing about it till a few years ago. And they they have this great stat, uh, basically clutch shooting. And I think how they do it, people do it differently, but they do it like last five minutes of the game, and it's got to be like within three points one way or the other. And Kobe's stats were never good right. for that. And got somebody like Carmelo Anthony, Ray Allen, even Nowitzki had one awesome year. But, you know, you can we can pretty easily spell out how many shots a guy took in the last five minutes of a close game and how many he made, how many times he went to the line, how many assists he had, how many turnovers he had. And Kobe's numbers were never that good. So it almost seems like there's been this false narrative of his career because he takes so many shots. We remember the ones he made. We don't remember any of the ones he missed. It reminds me a little bit of Reggie Miller and his career. And everybody, because of those two Knicks series, everybody has now convinced themselves that this guy was a superstar and he, and he just wasn't. You know, what, what other false narrative guys are out there that you think? Well, the one who's blatantly amazing but hasn't really gotten the attention is Chris Paul. Uh, his, his Hornets are literally the best team by far in crunch time, you know, in terms of their total offense. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, it's because of the shots he takes, but also because of just, you know, using their offense, which is what, yep. uh, you know, I think Kobe doesn't do. I think the key moment, to, not to blow up your question, I, I want to get there, but, um, but I think the key moment to think about in this whole analysis is in Michael Jordan's 55-point game when he came back against the Knicks. Um, I bet you know what year that was. I don't. But uh, 95. So he, you know, he, he, he jumps up in the lane and he's double teamed. And what he, he's presented with right there is an incredibly difficult shot, right? So there's the people who are a fan of what Kobe Bryant does will say, all right, if he takes that shot and makes it, he's a hero because the defense is so hard. But in fact, what he did was something really easy, right? He, he fired an, a simple pass like an eighth grader coach would have you do to a wide open player, Bill Wennington, who made a simple undefended play. 
there was no hero complex there, right? Like that was just basic basketball. Yeah. Really good for the Bulls. You know, really good for winning. Not so good for this other game that isn't basketball, which is, you know, clutch time heroics contest. So, you know, I think uh, I think Kobe wins the clutch time heroics contest hands down. And that's all that matters to some people. But he doesn't win the, you know, who has who who's the best person to give the ball to if you need a bucket contest because often what you want there is a pass. Kobe wins the who can make the most impossible crunch time shot and actually make it. He's the right. best guy since Larry Bird, in my opinion. Right. 1.8 seconds on the clock, double teamed, falling out of bounds. That's the, you want him shooting that. Or even, you know, on the road, nine seconds left, down three, he'll take a 30-footer and make it, something like that. But, you know, as you pointed out, Chris Paul's execution this year, especially because I don't even think he's healthy. Right. Like, it seems like he's on one leg. I asked Nick Collison about that on the BS report, and, you know, other players don't ever want to talk about other players, but he basically right. admitted, like, yeah, they don't run the same place for him anymore because, you know, it might be a two-year injury for all we know. He's on not going leg, to the rim nearly as much. It's, it's no, obvious. He never calls his own number, but somehow is 97% as effective as he normally was. I also think... Yeah, for some reason I'm in the minority with this, but I always feel like Dirk is just deadly in the last two minutes. Like, he scares me, when, especially going against the Celtics. I just feel like he's going to make it every time. Well, that's the thing. You know, there's, there's another little thing that's unfair here where, you know, Kobe's always very covered. And so that's why his shots look so impressive because he's, you know, he's got two, three guys around him. Um, Dirk is much hard, harder to cover. You know, he's just taller. I mean, it's not as, it's not as exciting to watch, but... You know, he's, uh, so I'm looking here, he's 25 of 65 in a one or two point or tie games in the last, you know, basically his whole career. Yeah. That's 38.5%, which is really good. That's top 10 in the NBA over that period. Um, but he's a guy, you know, when you watch him take those shots, he's basically, you know, who cares if there's some 6'5 guy jumping around his ankles or not? Like, you know, he's just taking a jump shot. It doesn't look as heroic. Carmelo is another guy that I think is just ice. Yeah, that, that'll be really interesting if he if the Knicks can pull this trade off, which I think it seems like it's it's headed in that direction because, you know, they're they're obviously not as talented as Miami or Boston or Orlando or even Chicago, but he's somebody that if the game's tight in the last three minutes like it was last night, you go to him and he can stand up against anybody and trade crunch bat crunch time baskets with them, and uh, you know that's why as as a Celtics fan I'm a little afraid of him. Going there. Is there anybody else that we would put in that class? Uh, well, Ray Allen, I would put there. Ray but, I mean, it's there. you got to create. He's got to be coming off the right screen, and you know, there's a lot of work getting Ray Allen those shots. Uh, Darren Williams is 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 very skilled at in crunch time moments. I think I'm kind of cherry picking from the list here. Uh, he's. Darren, I would say him for regular season, but I think he's had some playoff moments when I wanted him to take over and he didn't. Yeah, so I fair? think that we get into this small sample size thing, though, right? Not to sound like a yeah. total dork, but, like, you know, you don't really learn something about somebody, I don't think, in, like, two or three opportunities. And crunch time is actually pretty rare. So, like, to have a one- or two-point game in the last 20 seconds, like, you know, I think there are guys who could be the best in the world at that, but they just don't happen to get in that situation very often or they don't get the ball. But, you know, in, in the big picture, I think the best way to answer it really is just to put together all the video clips of all the touches where you take your 10 candidates and just watch every touch in a super crunch time moment. Right. And all the misses, all the makes, all the turnovers, all the everything. And then after watching all that, I think I would want to have, like, that's when you make your call. You know, and I don't, that's where I think we'd probably end up picking, you know, Carmelo or Chris Paul or, you know, there, there's some candidates, but I don't think it's going to be Kobe Breen Bryant. No, and I agree with you. And, you know, this is why I love basketball the most for – just talking about it because, I, yeah, the stats matter, but only to a certain degree. We still have to watch the games, and there's still things you can pick up about the nuances of the game and the way guys play in certain situations. Like, for instance, Gallinari last night. Gallinari. I, I said that wrong. I can't say it like the Knicks PA announcer. He called that. Um, he, uh, he made a huge three. Right. And not only had the balls to take it and make it, but it actually seemed like he thought he was going to make it. And now, if I'm watching that game and I'm the Denver GM, I'm thinking, all right, I'm not, you know, this guy is probably not the next Dirk Nowitzki, but I'm watching him play on a really big stage on national TV and rising to the occasion. Like, that's a guy I want on my team. And, I, and this is, that's one of the things I love about basketball is, yeah, we can look at all this evidence and I think it's really helpful, but at the same time, 
you still have to watch the games to see moments like that. Like even Corey Brewer the other night against Oklahoma City. Corey Brewer is a guy that I've always kind of liked because he's got the lottery pedigree and he's been trapped on bad teams. I feel like he's could be a really meaningful role player on a contender, but we'll never know that on the team he's on now. And, I, you know, I felt like he rose to the occasion against Oklahoma City. You've You've struck a better balance than I have with not only watching the games, but diving into this whole statistical world. At what point do we go too far with the stats? No, I don't, look. I think we live in a, a strange world. Like like Malcolm Gladwell was explaining, like his you know his dad's a mathematician, and and even in his own field at a conference where he's presenting, if he goes across the hall and listens, he can't understand what anybody's saying. You know, so because you know our our knowledge these days is like more intricate than what people can just carry around in their heads. It's just you know the world is very complicated. We know a ton about it. So I think we want to try to keep, you know, the, the conversations we have on a human level, but I, I don't think there's such a thing as, you know, having too much evidence. I just think that, you know, how we deploy the evidence matters. So is the final analysis going to be, you know, a spreadsheet? I don't think so. But is there a spreadsheet that is useful that we should just ignore? Like, no, I don't think we can really do that anymore. I think we've got to say, you know, hey, coach, you know, like when you run this play, like it fails every time, you know, stop running that play. Like, you know, like we can, that might not be something you'd know with your, naked eye, but you can know it from some kind of analysis. So I think, you know, you try to be smart with it. There's, there are failures in, in every kind of geeky analysis. But I think, you know, and on this thing, this Kobe thing, this is where, like, what Phil Jackson wrote in his book when he wasn't employed by the Lakers, saying that Kobe basically was a ball hog who ruined right. their crunch time plays. Like, that's that's not analysis. That's just straight-up coaching, right? And, and he was exactly right, and that's what the numbers show. And when those things all are in lockstep, you know, that, that tells you something. One of the stats that I really like, I, there are stats that I really like and I think collectively can give you a really good snapshot of, of who matters and what's going on. I don't think any of them individually really tell you that much, but you add them together. And one of the good ones is that five-man plus minus. Right. And, you know, I saw Utah in person on Tuesday night, and they were so reprehensibly bad that – <laughs> the next two days, I was actually Googling them and going to their, you know, the blogs that write about them and their Salt Lake Tribune or whatever the paper is. And they had this one, so one of the bloggers, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was, wrote about how the five-man unit that has played the most minutes for them is also the unit that has by far the worst plus minus. And it's that unit that when you're watching it, it doesn't make sense. It's Karolenko, Millsap, and Jefferson with Raja Bell and Darren Williams. And the front line doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. And you know, Jerry Sloan keeps playing it. And he keeps playing it. Keeps playing it. Right. So I love that the plus minus backed up what I was watching. Right, right, right. Well, that's so. You know, NBA is a game of runs, right? So, you know, every team has its runs, but you know, Phoenix plus minus kind of says, well, who, who was out there when they had that run? You know, and it sort of puts it all together into one handy thing. And it doesn't mean that, you know, there haven't been really good teams where they have a good run and happens that. Great players on the bench, and that can absolutely happen. And you yeah. get left behind and plus minus that night. But over a big chunk of time, you know, I think it's. Well, don't, don't you want to know how the team did while you're on the court? And by the way, that's the that's the stat that I think every player's bonus should be structured around that, right? Like, yeah, you know, that's that's what you want to motivate guys to do is to outscore the other team while you're on the floor. It's also interesting, as you said, when you once you get the larger sample size, just being able to look up stuff because, like, I'll watch Oklahoma City and I'll think. Man, it just seems like they should play Abaca, Green, Westbrook, Durant, and Harden, and just go all athlete. Just right. un- unleash the hounds, small ball. Right. And then I look up the plus minus, and it's like, ah, oh, yeah, it's not that good. <laughs> not that good when they do that. There's probably a reason why. And then somebody like Nick Collison, who to the naked eye, you're like, ah, hey, Nick Collison, why would they give that guy all that money? Oh, and but he's, he's a beast at protecting the rim, man. Yeah, and you look at the plus minus, and whatever five man unit he's in. You know, it seems like it's doing pretty well for the most part. So I like that. I also, the stat that the last 12 months, I think, has really jumped out at me is the usage rate stat, which is something right. that um, we never really put together the pieces of that with with uh, LeBron, Wade, and Bosch. And just for people who don't know, usage rate, basically, it measures how involved you are, or, you know, out of 100 possessions for your team that you're on the floor, how many of them you're actually involved in. So either you're creating the shot or you're creating the pass for somebody else, whatever. And LeBron, Wade, and Bosh were all over 30% or something, right? So it was just like if you just did the equation, it would have been impossible for the three of those guys not to suffer, suffer statistically. We should have realized that as fantasy owners. Right. 
but we didn't. But wait, what other stats have you enjoyed that have kind of popped up these last couple of years? Um, I mean, I, in a world with PER, I, I I can't stand to see people say like, oh, well, he averaged you know 14 points, 15 rebounds, and you know five assists, blah blah. We used to always do that. I used to write for magazines. We'd put those those kinds of strings of stats behind names and. But you know, now that we have PER, like that's a better way to just synopsize that info. Like it's, I'm not saying that PER is magic, but you know all that stuff that's in the box score is like properly weighted and displayed here. So you know, spare me the, you know, would you rather have a guy with 12 points and 18 rebounds, or or 18 points and 10 rebounds, or you know, like it's just just give us the PER. It's a pretty good summary there. See, um, that's where we differ, Henry Abbott. Okay, let's hear it. I don't mind PER. I think it's useful, but. Um, I think it's a flawed stat. I've told Hollinger this. Like, I like it. I'm glad we have it. I think, you know, it measures, first of all, it only measures offense. Well, that's the big problem, right? But that's true of every stat. Yeah. But, um, so, but still, same with wind shares. It's only measuring one side of the court. And then the other thing. Yeah, that's my problem with it, too. But it does seem like it's skewed a little bit more toward guys who, you know, forwards who shoot a higher percentage of shots. Like, it, it doesn't really weigh in the part where I'm Paul Pierce and we're not playing with Shaq and KG and Big Baby's hurt and I'm going to have to take a lot of shots tonight and maybe I'll only make 40% of them, but that's the only way we have a chance to win this game. Otherwise, our offense is going to collapse. Like, it doesn't give anybody any leeway who has to assume a bigger burden for their team. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, but I think, like, people do this, right? They put – so – so PER is not a perfect stat, basically, you're saying. And I think John Hollinger would agree with you. Yeah. But, you know, this is the seven zillionth stat, right? All of them before it were imperfect, too. So why do we suddenly only re- want perfect stats? Like, you know, points per game used to be pretty much how we judge players, right? That old list in the back of the newspaper, and it's like, here's, you know, Michael Jordan at the top. And, and that was basically, for most fans, like, that's the list of total player quality. Yeah. And, you know, that was the dumbest thing ever. Um, you know, we know that a zillion times over. So... You know, now we have one that's much better, like a much better picture, much closer to the truth. And now we're all nitpicking it. I feel like, yeah, you know, one day we'll figure out how to measure defense and, you know, situational specialties, stuff like that. But, you know, for what, where we are right now, you know, maybe, we, maybe we're not in a time where we should have a single number that tries to encapsulate the entire game because we're no. bound to fall short. But if you're interested in something really quick, that's the one. And that's the one that I look at. What do you think of wind shifts? Well, I get, you know, it comes down to this, like, how much do you value the ability to create a shot? And, you know, and, you know, David Barry is on the not very much side and John Holland is on the quite a bit side. So, you know, it, it seems to be, I mean, I guess the critique of win shares, I guess, is if you, it, it would tell you that if you had five Ben Wallaces, you'd win the title every year, right? Whereas, like, nobody yeah. really thinks that, right? So, you know, I think it's a really smart way to model basketball, but still, like, PER imperfect and seems to overvalue rebounding to me, just from to my, like, gut feeling of it. But I like well, we're here to talk about how gut feelings are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I like, uh, I mean, I'm glad we have all this stuff, and I think they're getting better, but I don't, I don't like when people, when people um, write some sort of opinion on whatever and just definitively cling to whatever one of the stats is as the backup for what they're saying. I think you have to you know, grab a whole bunch of different pieces, but also sprinkle in what you're actually watching. Well, and this whole thing is embryonic, right? Like the, yeah. the idea that we're going to put all of the complexities of basketball into numbers is a is a, a incredibly new idea, and we're guaranteed to have totally different numbers five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now. So to get all dogmatic at this stage is dumb to me. It's like, look, you know, we're they're, they're doing the best with what, with what we have right now, but yeah. you know there's, there's going to be much better stuff, and we're going to feel dumb for getting all holier than thou about it now. Well, and you and I are two of the uh, Sloan Conference junkies. I <laughs> love it. And uh, that's coming up at the beginning of March, which I, I've deemed Dorkapalooza. But I've already got it in my calendar to shave that week. So <laughs> it's great, and it's you know it goes in that direction where everybody's trying to figure out it'll it'll never be baseball. Right. And we'll know, you know, baseball is an individual sport, and we are able to measure everything a baseball player does to a T. And the stats are getting better and better. This, in a sport where you're relying on your teammates as much as basketball, we'll never master it. But I think we're heading in a good direction. And you know, you just think like even like the five man plus minus and the usage rate and the PER, and the win shares to a lesser degree. Like those are four really good stats. Right. I like all of them. Uh, well, you so look you, through it and you find stuff, right? There, there are trends. Yeah. Like I, uh, David Barry and Martin Schmidt's book, uh, Stumbling on Wins, 
basically has this really great proof, like, you know, when in the NBA draft, people undervalue rebounding. You know, you can be a great rebounder in college and who should be drafted, you know, high. And those guys tend to slip. It just, you know, so at this point in time, that's a value play in the draft is to go for a big rebounder. And some of those great draft picks like, you know, Paul Millsap and Carl Landry, like they were great rebounders in college and they still yeah. are in the NBA and that's valuable. So I think like, you know, to the extent that, that, you know, this research can just turn up stuff like that, that's great. And also, you know, players who did well in the NCAA tournament get drafted way too high consistently. So, you know, these are good things to know. Like going into the draft, don't you want your team to know that those are two ways people are commonly hoodwinked? You know, just like don't fall in love with the guy from the tournament and go for a rebounder if you're if you're teetering between two equivalent players. You know, I think those are like good things to know. That's one of my biggest problems with the tournament. I always get overexcited for guys that are doing well. Right. I, I, I'm still amazed Omar Samhan didn't make a team. I know. <laughs> just from just from his one good game that I watched. Um, back to the the Kobe piece for a second. So. And plus, by the way, you brought out Alak Patani, who's one of our ace in the whole research guys. Oh, he's the best, man. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I, you, when I saw his name involved, I was like, oh, Abbott brought out the heavy guns for this. <laughs> he's, uh, he's the bee's knees, man. I'm, I, was, I was toying between, like, should I put his name in here? No, you got it. He's and not. Being, and then yeah. I asked him, and he was like, well, if you did, that's cool. But part of me was like, I want, I want him to be a secret. <laughs> secret yeah. No, but, well, yeah. he's out. You revealed it. But yep. So you know this piece is coming, and you know how the Internet works. And you know how how insane the Laker fans are. Um, what kind of hate mail are you getting? Oh, a lot. Uh, actually, it's fun. I've been hitting a little refreshing on Twitter with the people mentioning me, and like, <laughs> I mean, I can't read any of this on the yeah on the podcast. <laughs> you're the you're the antichrist for Laker fans right now. You've replaced me. I, I know. Well, you live in L.A. though. I mean, this I know. is uh, you're in a different position. <laughs> but, uh, right. That's but true. yeah, I'm going to LA for the All Star game, so that'll be exciting. All right, hopefully you won't get maimed. But yeah, people just write like you know, like honestly, like a, a one that I could read is you know, it's like you know, this is total crap. You know, like our Laker fans don't read this, and then you know, everything from oh, I'm amazed you you know, expletive, expletive, LeBron, you know, blah blah blah, you know, back to what a jerk I must be. Or and people actually, here's the sad thing to be honest, like. It, the only way a lot of these Laker fans can conceive of why someone would write this is because I evidently hate Kobe Bryant. Like, basically, yeah. I went through everything I could find about the man's life, found the thing that made him look dumbest, and decided to write about that, right? Whereas, in fact, like, you know, Kobe Bryant's an absolutely marvelous player and a professional, and I have nothing but respect for the guy. And I totally relate to him since he, I read somewhere, like, in the summer, he gets up super early works out then so we can go back spend time with his kids like i actually do that like every day i work out really early and then you know go have breakfast with my kids before i come to work and you know like not a lot of people do that but but kobe and i do and i interviewed him you know a decade ago or whenever he called my house we talked for a long time and you know i think he's a great guy i had no beef with kobe at all like, I, I really don't but you know what i have beef with is you know millions of people just being absolutely dogmatic saying you're crazy if you don't think he's the best in the world. Like, you know, he's not the best crunch time scorer. Like, I'm, I'm really yelling not at Kobe, but at those people who are just like, stop all other considerations. There's only one candidate. It's like, no, nah, I mean, there are lots of candidates. And, and frankly, your guy is not going to win. Like, there's a, there's a, a multi, multi-candidate contest, and, 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 and you're probably going to come in like 11th. Well, you also have to look at, people forget what we do for a living. Is It's our job to construct arguments and then argue them and use the evidence that we have at our disposal and then try to make it entertaining. Right. And that's that's what you're supposed to do when you write a column or an extended blog post like the one you wrote or whatever. Um, people seem to forget that sometimes. It's not right. you're not you're not personally attacking Kobe Bryant. You're you're attacking um, a false narrative about his career. Right. 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 A, that's a huge difference. And, you know, I, I I've been known to take a controversial opinion or two from time to time. No way. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Get the and, uh, out here. And uh, that's what people seem to forget sometimes, you know. Hey, what's weird is, like, be a, like your beloved Portland. Like, Portland thinks that I'm, like, against the Blazers. Like, why would I hate the Blazers? Give me one reason why I, I would not like the Blazers or I would not want them to do well. Like, I, I just, know why. Well, Duran Odin, I mean. No, it's because you have a tremendous allegiance to Portland, Maine, which is somewhere near oh. where you grew up. And so you're jealous that this other Portland is bigger and cooler. <laughs> It's it's funny though, like people think like I like I'll get emails from Blazer fans like you happy? 
Right, Tomb, right. Tomb hurt his knee. You happy? I'm like, no, I'm not. Why would that make me happy? I'm not happy at all about that. Let's talk about that quickly. Um, Portland. Yeah. What's going on here? Like, do we have to perform an exorcism? I, I have a radical position that pisses off Blazer fans, which is I don't want to hear anything about bad luck or whining or anything. I think, and that's because this particular market has a particular problem with that. I'm, I'm, I reached over. I'm holding in my hand uh, the book about when they went to the finals in 1990. The name of the book is Against the World. And it's like, you know, really? Like, like, like they, they went through the same things every good team goes through where you right. have to fight long odds. And, but for this team, it's the entire world conspired against them. Like, get over yourself already. Like, life's hard. Basketball's hard. The NBA's hard. And, uh, you know, if it seems hard, it's not because you're particularly victimized. It's because it's hard. Like, this is a team with one of the richest owners in sports with a whole bunch of young talent. And sure, okay, it didn't go as well as it could have. You know, yes, probably your two most valuable players have, you know, severe injuries. But so what? Like, there's a deep well of talent. You're, you're a middling team even after a bunch of bad luck. You know, a couple of breaks going your way down the road, you're good again. You know, I think it's just, you know, you, you do the best you can with what you have, and, and they have as much as most teams. You know, very few teams have better rosters. It's just, you know, it sucks that this isn't a great time to be a Blazer fan, but whatever. You know, there's better days ahead. I would argue that it's been less bad luck and more kind of a little bit bad management. Like, but Bowie over Jordan was indefensible. Um, Odin Durant, they just picked the wrong guy. You know, I, I know at least two teams were going to pick Durant out of that combo that were in the lottery. Um, giving Brandon Roy that gigantic contract extension when everybody knew about his knees, I don't think that was a good move. I don't know, man. I think uh, if you only give big contracts to players with clean bills of health, like you're limiting yourself to like a third of superstars. I know, but you're talking about Brandon Roy when he came in the league. Like the Celtics had that pick and traded him because they looked at his knees and they were like, "Wow, that guy is not in five years is going to be in trouble." So I talked to uh, I talked to one of the smartest GMs in the league, and uh, I won't tell you who it is, but see if you can figure it out. Um, mm. He was like. Uh, he was like, you know what I do? I ignore all those stinking doctors because they just like they don't have to win a championship. Well, all mm-hmm. they have to do is not get you to sign a guy who might turn out to be injured. Like they have a totally different agenda. Like, but if you want to win a championship, you got to take some risks. And uh, that's interesting. You know, so you know, it, literally, like it's impossible to get a superstar. Like you just can't. You know, like ask, you know, ask a lot of GMs who don't have one. Like there's just nothing you can do to get one. So you know, now you're gonna have one like Brandon Roy, well, star superstar, whatever you want to call him. You know, have an all-star player and just take yourself out of the running for him because there's, what, a 20, 30, 40% risk of his injury slowing him down. Like, you just, you're just not in a position to do that. The resource is too precious. Like, it's too rare. You're not going to get another Brandon Roy no matter what you do. So I would agree with that. But if you're going to give him all that money, it's not like giving Kevin Durant that money. And you're just like, this guy is going to play the next five years barring some sort of catastrophic injury. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, but there was those a little star bit players of risk are worth, it. like, like so no, they're actually worth, like, you know, Thirty million a year, like, but the salary cap prevents you from paying them that. So, hmm. you know, are you going to pay? I think for whatever brand, like a fifteen or whatever. You know, if you're going to pay him half of what he's worth, healthy, you know, with a, you know, sixty percent likelihood that he's going to be there healthy for five years, like it's a good deal. I mean, any team would do it. I don't like if you let him go on the open market. You think he would have gotten less? Like I think if you want him, you got to pay him like that. And there's risk. It's just a risky proposition, and it doesn't always go your way. Look at the Knicks with Amari. I mean, they gave him that $100 million. They were Woo. like, this guy's got a bad eye and bad knees. And we're just hoping we get to year four. He's got, like, two of the worst injuries. I mean, I, like, yeah. I feel like dirty saying anything like that. But that, you know, I, I am nervous every time I watch him play. I really yeah. am. Him and Blake Griffin are the two nerve-wracking guys. I know. Blake is all over the place. Like, so, as a Portland fan, how do you see this Odin thing playing out? Do they trade him? Do they just give him a fresh start somewhere else and cash in? Because he still has a lot of stock. Like with the other GMs, I think there there's at least six teams that would absolutely roll the dice with him and give up an asset for him. I think. Yeah, I I mean, this is where there's a difference between what's best for the team and what gets the GM fired. You know, like. Mm. But I think if you trade that guy away and he becomes, you know, even half of what he might become, everyone thinks you're the biggest idiot ever. Like now we're having the same conversation ten years from now, and like, what are you talking about? He's the number one overall pick, the next Bill Russell. How do you trade that guy for? For you know Michael Beasley or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's a very tough proposition. I honestly think that probably the move is you just keep him around forever, and you know hope that one day when he does shine, it's for you. 
you know, and it, it, it's painful and it's probably not psychologically delightful for Greg himself, who I'm sure would love to just anything new in his life would be good now, right? Like, like different is better for him. Yeah, but, I think he needs a change. And it's something that Portland did. I just think it's he's at the fresh start point of his uh, his NBA career. I'd love to see the two teams out, obviously Phoenix, just to put that crazy training staff on him. It'd be really great. And then I think going home to Indiana. And that's actually a good trade match for them because they could give him back Hibbert, who's got his own set of problems. Done. I'll do that deal right now. A couple other things. Um, or or Miami would be good because they don't actually need him. Even your team, the Celtics, like you know, a team yeah. where, you know, hey, if we have a productive young center, we can we can put him to real good use. But if we don't, then we'll we got this Turkish guy or whatever. You know, like that's a I think that's a good situation for him because he doesn't have to have the way of the franchise hanging on his shoulder. Can we that. blame Portland's training staff at all for a lot of this stuff? It's too hard to know. But I'll tell you this, yeah. man: if I owned an NBA team, first of all, I would have so much money; it'd be ridiculous. But yeah. um, but how much is it worth? Like. You know, could you possibly overpay the Suns' training staff? Like, no. Why not? I mean, they're probably worth if they can get Greg Oden playing. Like, let's say, give him an extra year of productivity. They're worth thirty million dollars or something like that. You know? Yeah. Like, I don't know why you wouldn't just put so much money into that, or you know, Arnie Kander in Detroit, or you know, so these these guys who just know how to get players playing and and happy and healthy. I mean, they are worth their weight in absolute gold, and I can't understand why they're not. Just top of the list of most coveted NBA personnel. And the irony of it is that Phoenix has one of the cheapest owners who has one of the shortest pockets in the league, and somehow right. he has the best training staff. But it does feel like Paul Allen could just say, I'm overpaying to steal those guys away. Yeah. Name your price. Okay, right. fine. Oh, you know what? I'll fly you in my private plane back and forth from Phoenix if you don't want to live here. It's like oh, you used to remodel our entire gym with all this equipment you want. Like, yeah. Perfect. You want assistance to mix special tinctures and balms, like, done, you know, whatever it is. Right. Last question, then we got to get to Mark Stein. You bet you were on the forefront of this uh, of the sports blog thing. And I, I've noticed the last couple of years, and I, I don't dive into it because it's one of those things that I start reading and I can't stop. And also I have my own whole process for coming up with NBA observations, stuff like that. But what I've noticed when I'm trying to research what happened to that guy or what's going on with this team, and I'll check out some of the team sites. The writing's just better. Like it, yeah. it really seems like over the last four years, the 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 angles that people take and the information they have and how they dissect a, a team and the and just everything, it just seems like it's a lot better. What do you think the reason is for that? Well, imagine if we had a stadium full of people and you just handed out a megaphone like everybody in the stadium. Like, one minute in, you'd have just like, bah! you know, but, but after a year or two or three years of people living in that very loud stadium, they would, people would naturally kind of listen to some people more and less to others, and, and everybody's getting feedback the whole time, right? If you start a speech that's really dumb, everybody walks away, and you know, I think it, it's, a, it's a honing process, and people who are really passionate about it, you know, will stick with it through thick and thin, and they're getting good feedback, and you know, I think it's just it's 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 a way to get good at stuff is to do it every day and have people give you feedback on it and that's yeah. just been happening more and you know I'm, it seems I'm, like I'm, some of the guys are younger. Like yeah, they're, they're, I think the Nets, the Nets blogger. Yeah, I noticed was like in college or one of yeah, the bloggers some, was like at USC. I was like, wow, this guy's a better writer than I was at college. John Krolik writes about the Cavs. He goes to USC. Yeah. He, he's absolutely you know, a beautiful writer. Rob Mahoney is. A college age uh, blogger who is writing for the New York Times often now. Like, you know, he's. Wow. You know, there's plenty of these guys. And, you know, if you think about how we used to hire sports writers, you know, by and large, it'd be somebody who had a connection to the paper or the magazine. I got in because I went to high school with the managing editor of Slam. Like, um, you know, and, and, but that's not a meritocracy. That's not how you identify the good writers. So now yeah. it's a chance to, like, look, if you're really good and you hammer away for a year, 18 months, or two years, then people are going to notice. You know, they, they're going to come find you and, and, Including decision makers in, in sports media will come and find you and and maybe give a spotlight to your work, which is which is pretty great. It makes me jealous because you know I started my site in '97. It was the wild, wild west. Yeah. And there was none of that stuff now. Nobody was on the same team. Guys weren't linking to each other. Nobody knew how to link to each other. <laughs> right, right. Like you right. didn't. <laughs> first 18 months, I was only on AOL, and then after that, it was like people were just so so dumb with the internet. You know, people would just copy paste my entire column and forward it, and somehow my name wouldn't be on it. And you know, I look at the the way that uh, 
people can be found now, and it just I I just hope people realize that it's a different era and it's and it's lucky if you're good, people are going to find you. Yeah, it's no, it's true. It it's now. a much more crowded field now. So like I yeah. think it's, like if you start, you know, when we started the Troop Network, I would say, hey, you know, start a really good insert team name here blog, and it'll get a big audience. Now, if someone starts a new you know, Cavaliers blog today, I don't even know how I'd find out about it because there are like 150 of them and, True. and and five of them are good, you know, so. But if somebody's really good, you're eventually, well, you'll eventually know. Yeah, that's true. If they're, if they're really good. It's, so it's, it's good. It's like anything else. It's a meritocracy. It's getting there. It's getting there. Well, congratulations on your role in it. And I, I've especially appreciated how you, you always stay above the fray and you just kind of bang out your thing and you stay, you know, you stay maintain good relationships with everybody, but you do good work and you don't take cheap shots or any of that stuff. I, I just, I admire how you've handled it. That's very kind of you to notice that and say that, but I don't think any Kobe fans agree with you at all. <laughs> well, I, I, I wanted to grease you up at the tail end just for in case any of the death threats or letter bombs that you might get <laughs> over the next, uh, next couple of months. Henry Abbott, we'll see you on the uh, True Hoop blog on ESPN.com. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Bill. All right. Remaining in the ESPN.com family, we're going to bring in Mark Stein. The reason I wanted to bring him in, other than to uh, feel him up for trade rumors, was uh, I wrote my column this week about um, Kobe and Nash and Dirk and Allen and Pierce and their generation and extending their primes. And I actually called called this guy, Mark Stein, who's on the Subway Fresh Take hotline right now, to get his take on Dirk. And he's followed both of those guys, Dirk and Nash, pretty much for their whole careers. Steiny Mo, how long did these guys keep playing? I mean, Dirk definitely goes beyond this contract. He's in the first year of a four-year deal. Nash, I could see him making a run at 42, even though, what, he's only got one more year to go on his current contract? Then maybe, like, unless, two... Uh, unless, he gets a, unless he gets a soccer offer that takes him away from the NBA. <laughs> that would be a big story. He's got, uh, he's got Stockton potential. I, I mean... Think about Nash and how his back was in 01, 02, and 03. And did you ever think he would have Stockton potential? It's just inconceivable to me. Well, I remember being in the gym when he landed really bad in Dallas. And that whole first year, he he basically in Dallas, he basically played with a broken back and and didn't know it till the end of the season. But he's just changed his body, changed the way he does everything. I mean, if you go back and look at early Steve Nash pictures. Uh, of how he looked when he was in, in, in Phoenix at the beginning. And, you know, he was, you know, you wouldn't say chunky, but, like, I think they told him in those days, you know, keep meat on you. You're going to need it to, you know, you're going to get beat up so much in the NBA. You need that extra padding. And you look at him now, and he's just completely different. I mean, he's, you know, he, he, he went for the cyclist look now. Right. But you said, you told me yesterday when we talked about this, that Nash and Nowitzki – we're in on this working their asses off in the gym thing about four or five years before pretty much everybody else in the league. I mean, they were definitely the first guys that I covered on a daily basis that I was really aware of that every practice day they went back to the gym at night. In those days, Kiki Vandeway was a Mavs special assistant. The three of them would just you know practice at 11, done at 1, back in the gym at 8 o'clock for extra shooting, full court one-on-one, just kind of all kinds of crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, before them, I really don't remember hearing about too many guys that were doing that. And now I think that's, you know, I wouldn't say standard, but I think a lot of guys do do that. They'll just go back and shoot at night and just everybody takes their game, I think, more seriously. Summer League is more is way more serious than it was. There's so much more international ball than there was 20 years ago. Now that all these guys can can play. I mean, there's tournaments every summer. I mean, there's to me, there's just no such thing really as a summer off anymore. Yeah, and you, I didn't make this point in the column, but I should have. I don't know how I would have squeezed it in, but um, when Kobe was on that 2008 team, he kind of let some of these younger guys behind the curtain. And I don't think they realized how much time and effort he put into non-basketball stuff. And it definitely affected at least some of them, right? Yeah, and he, I mean, he's another one of those guys that, now, I actually was lucky. I, my last year in L.A. was, was his first year. So I got to cover, I got to travel with him one year. Uh, you know, he's way more maniacal now and has been in recent years than, than he was earlier in his career. And just, yeah. 
I mean, everybody's heard the stories about how early he wakes up in the off season and, and you know, just, just, uh, how serious he is. And I remember talking to him about this a couple years ago where he said, I haven't even fired the last bullet in my chamber, which is changing my diet. He, he thought at the time that he could still take it up even one more notch. Mm. But, you know, you know, Ray Allen, I think they showed the footage last night on TNT about how, you know, his pregame routine where he goes, yes. gets in a cab, goes a couple hours before, and what does he do, 150 makes before every game. Well, I think out of the five guys that I wrote about in the column, four of them were in on this stuff really early. And the last one is Pierce, who got into it late. And I think he's he got in it just in time because he has transformed the last part of his career. And actually, I think he's playing the best all-around ball that he's played. I know statistically he's had better seasons, but just watching him game in and game out, he's so efficient now. He knows exactly what he's going to do. He's in awesome shape. He's never tired. And, uh, and you know, it just makes me wonder where we're headed with this stuff. Which well, is I think where we're headed is I think teams are almost now trying to stop their guys from doing it and just saying, look, you need to keep more in the tank. You know, don't don't push yourself so hard mm. uh, because cause it's just, you know, it's just like, you know, like I guess Magic and Bird used to tell the story. You know, they would always say, you know, I knew Magic was shooting a thousand shots a day, so I've got to shoot twelve hundred. But the they really are doing that now, so it's everybody's trying to one up each other, and it's almost. I think teams are almost like, you know what? Take take a day off. Don't go yeah. back to the gym at night and shoot. You need to you need to rest. The seasons are are too long. I mean, that's the thing. All these guys have such ridiculous mileage, especially the high school guys. You know, Dirk's yep. pretty much in that category because he he didn't play college ball, and uh, I mean, they, 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 they all these guys have so many miles that they, they, they got. They just gotta watch it. Oh, I stole your Sam Perkins analogy. I meant yeah, I haven't read your piece yet. So yeah, I, I stole it. I'm I just curious, ripped it I'm off. I'm curious how much you did steal. Uh... I quoted you. I just ripped off the Sam Perkins thing. Though. I didn't even attribute it to you. I just took it because I liked it that much. But I forgive you. I love that analogy, though. And, I, you know, I was trying to think, was, is, there a better, is there a better person for the analogy? And the analogy is that when Dirk is past his prime, he he should be able to have the career that Larry Bird should have had at the tail end. Because if Bird's back didn't go out, I think he could have played till he was like 45. He well, just would have been look, three I'm point the most specialist biased guy. guy on earth on this topic, but I'm not gonna lie. I mean, all, when, when when Dirk passed Bird, I mean it pissed me off like how how Dirk was just scoffed at because he doesn't have a ring. You know, did he play with Parrish and McHale and, and, and DJ and all these amazing guys? I mean, you know, I've said it a million times. I'm going to keep saying it. Tell me who is Dirk Nowitzki's best teammate since 2004. And when you settle on your answer, whatever it is, if that team should be winning championships, I don't know what league you're watching. All right, I'm going to give you a, a very subtle and, and short settle down. Just to be careful with Larry Bird. Be careful taking his name in. No, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not and, and again, quick obviously, one. who who would diss Larry Bird? I mean, I love Larry and Magic so much that <laughs> no, I, know. I actually, you know, still put them ahead of Michael, which is a far bigger heresy that you know people think I'm crazy. But I mean, so I, I guess what I'm saying is, so when Dirk's 40 and he does the Sam Perkins and he and he wins a ring with whoever, now he's now he's a great champion. Right. Well, I think. Dirk's career has been uh, has been treated unfairly because if you just look at the stats, and it's been 11 straight monster years, you know, with no no dip, nothing. He's he's one of the most durable superstars that we've had. Like even just him getting hurt a couple weeks ago was kind of shocking. And then, as you pointed out, he you know it's not like he's been playing with junk. Like it's not like he was playing with the 2007 Cavaliers, but he he's never really had any help. He's had a lot of veterans. They always seem to be like three years past the year when they were really good, and that's just, it's just been a steady stream of him. Well, they, of those the Mavs guys. have always had deep teams. I yeah, mean, they deep. have you know. Although I I would say this year's team is probably not as deep as they thought, but I mean the formula has been proven. You got to have at least two superstars, and and today you probably need three, and. You know the Mavs. The Mavs have not. You know they've tried everything. They've tried 15 different trades and you know mm. everything they could possibly think of, but they haven't been able to come up with that other superstar to put with him. They've had some bad. They had bad luck because the year that they had all the assets that they could have traded for another superstar was uh, 
the Jawan Howard year, that was, you know, it was just slim pickings. And then when they made their other big run, they made it for Kid. And, you know, you and I have been arguing about this for four years, but they got Kid at a different point in his career. They weren't getting the Jason Kid from New Jersey. Well, you know, I still say that if if they could have manufactured that one other guy, I mean, Kid would be, uh, you know, could still do a ton. I, I, I mean, they, he, the problem in Dallas is he's had to do too much. He's had to carry too big a load. But, you know, I just think if they had one other offensive gun to put with them, that that kid could do a lot more damage. But but when you look at you look at what they gave up for kid versus what Denver gave up for Chauncey Billups a few months later, it's no contest. You have to at least admit that. I mean, they paid a hundred and ten cents on the dollar for kid. Well, I guess the difference is the Mavs were you know the day before the deadline and operating under. Much more desperation. Trade. I mean, Denver, was, you know, give them credit. They swung that deal, what, five days into the season? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think Cuban has been – I know he's your boy. I love him. I think he's been a great owner. But I, I think he's impulsive with stuff. I think he – you know, you look at that Brendan Haywood contract that he gave out, and I know uh, – the what's that website that defends him all the time? <laughs> DallasBasketball.com. I'll give him a plug. I enjoy, I enjoy their Fox News coverage of Cuban. Uh they they defend they defended the Hayward contract because the last year is you, you know you can waive it kind of like what they had with Dampier so that made it a good contract. Meanwhile, they're paying this guy nine or ten million dollars a year as a backup center, and it, I mean they they constantly do this. They never have cap flexibility. That's why they haven't been able to find the second guy. Right, and I think and I think that's why you know now everybody's wondering. Okay, Karan Butler's out. Are they going to go after? Do they go get Stephen Jackson? Do they go get Rip Hamilton? You know, no, I don't think they want contracts like that anymore uh, because as soon as they sign Haywood, what happens? This great opportunity to get Tyson Chandler comes up, and, and you've seen the impact Chandler's had this year, and everybody loves him here. And I mean, they've got to re sign Chandler. I mean, that's, yeah. that's priority number one. And I mean, half the time they'd rather play Jan Mahimney over Haywood the way he's going this <laughs> year. So uh, it's. Yeah, but it, the thing is, like. Chandler's yet another guy who's probably going to be overpaid. I like him. I think he's been fantastic this year. But that's somebody who's who's had serious trouble staying on the court. I'm not sure I want to give that guy $65 million. You know what, though? They've been so bad defensively throughout the Cuban era, except for, you know, Avery Johnson put such an emphasis on defense and was just so maniacal about it as a coach that, you know, the Mavs did play play good D at various points of the Avery era, but they've never had a guy like this. And no question, you have to factor in his health history, but he's the perfect complement to Dirk. He's long, athletic, moves well, vocal. He does every single thing that Dirk doesn't do. I mean, he's exactly what you would want next to Dirk as a center. So, Can we talk about how Oklahoma City could have Stephen Curry and Tyson Chandler instead of James Harden and... I don't know the Ned Christich. I mean, right now, I mean, I, how close that was that that could have been finally, the alternate universe. I think they're finally starting to feel some pressure here that they've got to that they've got to make a move. I mean, they've been waiting and waiting and been able to preach patience, and they've got such a loyal fan base. Yeah, but I mean, you know they, what? they've got to get bigger. I mean, they, they, they've 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 got to do something to get bigger. I really admire the the you know, and it's, I spent some time with Presty last month. And I really admire his philosophy on this, which is that we're in no rush. We want these guys to grow together. You know, everybody panics and whatever. I I get it. But I just don't – you just look at the history of the league and you look at how quickly somebody's career can change. Like look at Brandon Roy. Look at Reggie Lewis. Look at um, Penny Hardaway. There's a million guys. You just – you don't know. You only know what you have right now. And right now they have two of the best ten players in the league. So why not make a run at it? Yeah, because on one hand, they don't need Curry. I mean, they really don't need no, him. No, I'm just but, saying. But, but surely if you just had him as an asset, you could turn him into something um, you know, something better than James Harden. Mm-hmm. So. Well, regardless, they, they have Harden, and he's, he is what he is. They have some contracts. There's guys out there. Now, I keep looking at one guy, and it would be in contrast to everything Presti has done for four years. But if they were able to get Zach Randolph on this team for expiring contracts and a couple of those number ones they're holding, 
that transforms their team. Well, that's never going to happen because as we talked about with your new best friend, Nick Collison, you know, they put how a guy fits into the scheme there right. That, I mean, that's equal to talent. Okay. So even if, you know, I don't think, I don't think Zach is nearly as, bad as the reputation is now and the I don't the, think so either and the damage that this guy has done for the last I mean his numbers are just consistently ridiculous I think it's a false narrative about you but know I know no way no way the thunder takes a risk like that I, just, <laughs> I, I think they should though I, I mean how many times can this guy have 25 points and 15 rebounds in a game well the guy I wrote about late last night who I know intrigues Oklahoma City is Verizhou now he doesn't have any of that offensive yeah, that, that wrecking, doesn't change wrecking it. ball stuff that, that you're talking about. But I do think you know, the way Westbrook and Durant dominate the ball anyway, I, you know, I, I mean, that would be really interesting to see if he was on that team. But I don't think, first of all, he's out for the year. Secondly, I don't think that, that the Thunder really would have given up what it would take to get Verage out because he's on a pretty good contract. He's got a proven playoff resume. Cleveland doesn't want to trade him. They're certainly not just going to give him away. He, he he wouldn't excite you about them at all? He would, but he's hurt. I mean, I, I want to win the title this year. The title's open. You re- I, is it really open? It's open for a team that has Durant and Westbrook at the end of the game. I don't think they can win it with the team they have. but And they probably can't win it with Zach Randolph either. But, man, you're telling me you're trotting out at crunch time. Ibaka, Zach Randolph, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, and Jeff Green or, or Harden. Or Cephalosha, whatever. That's a that's a brutal team. I just don't see how is Zach ever going to get the touches to have Zach gets double impact. teamed. I mean, but that the, the, their whole setup is for two guys. How are they going to How are they going to work in another guy like that? Okay, I don't think you can double team Zach Randolph in that team. I think if with you have Westbrook and, and Durant out there, it's impossible to also double team Zach Randolph. So he's going to have he would have single coverage against anybody, any other big guy in the league, and he's proven the last two years that he's going to score on you if you are guarding him with one guy. Yeah, but he all, someone has to throw him the ball. I just don't see those guys. Yeah, well, I, it'll I, never I, happen I, anyway. Presti would never yeah, do Yeah, I mean, it, that's the thing. I just, I, I don't, I, I mean, that is just way too big a risk for, for, for their taste. Why are people so down on Zebo? I don't get it. Well, he's played really, really hard I mean, for hard this Memphis team. it's hard to change your reputation. Yeah, but he's older, you know, people change. You get I know I change from well, age it's twenty one to twenty eight. On one hand it's hard to change your reputation, but then on the other hand there is always that one team that will take a chance on you. I mean look, George Carl said it best whenever that was years ago. I mean when that guy, you know, lowers his shoulder, I mean he's 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 the best inside in the league. So we have I think Zebo is a very scary trade chip for the right team. I think Tayshawn Prince on the right team could really, really help somebody. Right, I guess I'm not. I'm not as huge of a. I, I don't see him as this huge over the top piece. Okay, let's say the Celtics had him coming off the bench instead of Marquise Daniels. Are we better? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, are the Celtics getting everybody? They're getting you know, Rip Hamilton's going to get bought out, and they're getting Rip. Rip now Hamilton's getting not Tayshawn. getting. He's not getting bought out. I know it's impossible. I, know, I, I mean, I, I honestly don't even know why that's talked about. I mean, the Pistons. The Pistons can't make trades because they're trying to get this yeah. sale done. Now they're going to buy out a guy who has two more years. than $25 million guaranteed over the next couple of years. I mean, it's uh, how is that going to work? It's ridiculous. The, uh, so out of the other available guys, O.J. Mayo is very scary, as I've mentioned many times. I'm terrified that Chicago is just going to steal him. Who else do you see? The, I mean, do you see maybe Camby being out there? I mean, Camby and Miller are still out there, but you know, Portland is another one of those teams that that likes to take its time, doesn't want to panic. I mean, I would have, I would have thought, honestly, I would have thought they would have made a move by now, mm. but they keep waiting. Uh, I mean, there's no question that there's interest in in those two guys, and I mean, it looks pretty clear that going from here, that that Aldrich, uh, West Matthews, and Batum, that's their you know that's their new core going forward. Ooh, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, yeah, like you got, come on, you got to give Aldridge some love. I mean, that guy's transformed his game. We killed him for years. For I know it's been great. Not going inside, and now he's—I mean—he's one of the top five in the league in scoring inside. I agree. 
But if that's your, if those are your best three guys, you're not winning a title. No, but they have the assets to get something else. I mean, I think that's the point. I mean, they're not, they they're not just going to give Camby and Miller away. Can they get something? Can they turn those chips into something good? And, and their core looks a little well, better. I hate to break it to them, but there's not a marker for Andre Miller. I mean, if you just look at the point guards on every team, what contend, what contending team needs Andre Miller? The only one I can think of is Atlanta. And what is Atlanta going to give up for Andre Miller for the upgrade from going from Mike Bibby to 34-year-old Andre Miller and then incorporating him into what they're doing? And I just don't think there's another option. I think Camby is somebody that could fit in a lot more seamlessly, and everybody needs big bodies. Man, I'm hoping Presty makes the move for him. He so didn't want to do it last so year. So basically what you're saying is your C's, you're not happy. You need You need somebody else. No, I'm happy with the C's. I would love to up, upgrade the Marquise Daniels spot. So the four C All Stars are not enough for you. You need it. You need a trade uh, yeah. too. I'm a demanding guy. The what fact is that? that? The Celtics and the Heat are going to account for seven of the twelve All Stars. <laughs> what is uh? What What are your boys in Dallas going to do? You know, I think I could see them going for Prince if they could pry him away from Detroit, only because he's a last year guy. And unlike, I mean, they, the Mavs need offense. I guess that's why. You know, Prince, to me, I don't see him as an over-the-top piece, especially I don't for them, because, I mean, their their weaknesses are on the offensive side, crazy as it sounds. Yeah. I, and that's why Steven Jackson, you know, he, I think fit-wise is probably the best guy, but, you know, they, they just, you know, Cuban is going to have to be convinced on any long-term deal that it is an over-the-top move, and, and there, there really isn't an over-the-top move that I think they can make. So, I mean, Prince is definitely on the radar, but... I mean, he's been on the radar for a while for a lot of teams, and yeah. it just doesn't seem like Detroit is ready to make deals because of the sale. I, I think he is a really intriguing one because the better the situation, the better he's going to play. He, I think you forget with these guys, especially guys that come right in the league and they're on good teams, how traumatic it is to suddenly be on a crappy team and how much that's going to affect your performance. And that's a guy that we've seen – play big in big games, which I think for Dallas, that's a good fallback. I guess just in my mentality, because he's so defense first, that that's why I struggle to see him as this huge I know, but he's got a landscape-changing chip. But, I mean, he, you know what, he has, he has played really well this year in pretty hideous circumstances. He probably hasn't gotten enough credit for that. He's got a sneaky game, though. Like, they'll go to him in crunch time, and he'll, like, be able to create a shot or get to the rim or whatever. Like, he can do that. He just chooses... Not to, for the most part. What about our boy Nash? I just, I, I, I mean, they consistently say, no matter how many times you go to them, say, okay, guys, we, we know your public position, but come on. This can't continue. How can you possibly continue down this path? You've got to set Steve Nash free. And they just, they are so resolute in saying no, 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 no matter how many times you ask them. I mean, it's hard to see it any other way. At this point, but, does Orlando and I, and, I, and I don't see Nash forcing his way out. I just that's you know it's just not his way. It's just, I, I mean, you know him. Yeah, I just don't see him doing that. What if not Orlando, in season? Well, what if Orlando said we want Nash and we're and we're more than willing to pay the Josh Childress tax as well? We'll take him too, and we'll give you back Jameer Nelson and a couple expirings and a number one pick and three million bucks. I mean, common sense says they would have to listen. I mean, there's other teams, too, that common sense would say they'd have to listen. I think, you know, Portland is another one of those teams that yeah, I don't doesn't know how do excited, anything for him, I, though. I don't know excited, how excited he'd be going there. But He's got to win a title. Well, but, I mean, it's not, it's not this. I mean, the Suns have to make the best deal for themselves. I mean, they can't just say we're only going to send him somewhere that, that his next team can win a title. Yeah, but he has the leverage of saying... I want to retire here, and the only way I'd want to leave is is um, if it's a great situation. And sending him to Portland is not a great situation. That just puts him in the same position he's in now. It's not a horrible situation, though. I know, yeah, we, but he I know, we, I know we disagree on this one. Really? Maybe he's the guy who can break the curse. Maybe he's so, uh, with his clean living diet, he can transform. He can lift the curse of injury, bad luck that Portland has. Well, maybe if, if Nash goes to Portland, then we really have to start thinking about, you know, I've been talking on Twitter a lot about America and Canada making a blockbuster deal in the country trade machine. And, uh, you know, I, I would much rather try to get Vancouver from Canada 
but I'm also willing to trade Portland to Canada. I'm open for everything. I just want the two countries to make a deal. I think it'd be fun. Somehow, I don't it. think we can trade one of the best fan bases on the NBA map. As much as I love Vancouver, I don't. I don't think we're going to be able to sell that one. Listen, no offense, because you live in Texas, but Canada to me feels like more America, more American to me than Texas does. I go to Texas, and how is Texas not its own country at this point? Well, I mean, I I love Canada. I've always said that. When ESPN opens the Toronto Bureau, I'm out of here, but they haven't yet. If you, had, if you made a list of things that Americans have in common with Canadians versus things Americans have in common with Texans, the why Canadian trying, list is going to be longer. Why are you trying to get Texas all riled up when aren't you going to be here in five minutes? <laughs> I love Texas. I'm just saying it, it's, it, it's like its own country you when you go. You can't go to Portland now since you just offered to trade them for British Columbia. <laughs> and now you're going to have to wear uh, – you're going to have to wear – some bulletproof protection now for Super Bowl week. People wear cowboy hats in public all the time. The women are dressed to the nines. Women dress in Texas That's like no other. Worth, not in Dallas. All right. I like Texas. I'm excited. You know, Austin is my number one city, but number two is totally up for grabs. And uh, and I'm more than willing to make Dallas my number two because I've, I've been there a couple of times and enjoyed it. Although, I mean, let's talk about the Super Bowl for a second. Traf- from a traffic standpoint, it's kind of going to be a nightmare, right? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, you know that I won't be going to the Super Bowl or anything to do with American football, so I'll dodge most of the traffic except when it's time to go downtown and see what mayhem you're causing. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about it. The Dallas-Fort Worth thing, I mean, a lot of people are going to be in Fort Worth. <laughs> I've lived here more than 10 years. I've been to Fort Worth, I think, twice in that yeah, whole time. It just seems uh, like and, it's and two separate cities. Everybody says it's a great place. Everybody says, great city, great place to hang out. I never, ever go there. Hmm. Um, when are you we, getting here? I don't know. Next week. We're going to do a couple podcasts. The, uh, I think I'm coming Thursday. Um, house? Is House going to have a, his, house own, uh, his own radio booth set up right next to Colin we're, Cowherd and Dan Patrick? Yeah, we're calling him next. Wait, did we cover all the possible trade chips here? Oh, we didn't talk about Mello. I mean, that's been the other problem, is that Mello has occupied so much time and energy that I do think there are several teams who've been, you know, waiting to see and hoping there'd be some sort of re- resolution there so things could start churning and moving. Mm-hmm. And obviously it didn't work out that way. Well, can we all agree that the narrative for the story has not changed since August? I mean, we've written a kajillion words about it. But it's the same story it was in August. He wants to play for the Knicks. Either you trade him there now or he'll sign there in the summer. That hasn't changed. Yeah, but he keeps throwing that curveball of how freaked out he is about not getting the extension. You know, what do you say this week? I'm screwed if I don't sign the extension. I don't know. I mean, that's what's kept this thing alive the whole time. God forbid he considered the clips. Well, I mean... Really? Basketball-wise, it'd be sensational. But, I mean, look, we all know until, until there's an ownership change, we can talk about We can throw out as many Clipper hypotheticals as you want. I mean, I finally got my first up-close look at Blake. Mm. Not all that thrilled that I got as many dunks as Blake injuries. Not what I was bargaining for. I couldn't but, believe it. But stunning to, like, look around the American Airlines Center and see Clipper Blake Griffin jerseys everywhere. It's unbelievable. And it, for once, I feel like Nike's dropped the ball here. Where, where are the ads? We we should be getting hit over the head with commercials by now. This is guy's a phenomenon. I've been I've been tweeting about it. I think since the first time I saw him in an exhibition game for five, I watched him for five minutes. I was like, oh my god, this guy's already one of the best five power forwards in the league. And everybody's like, you're crazy. He's like, no, listen, I I can only tell you what I'm watching. And this guy plays at a level that we just haven't seen before. He's crazy. It's insane. I mean, again, because I so rarely watch college. Was he this exciting in college? No. I mean, he just like, no. I mean, anticipation-wise, I mean, people were just giddy here. You know, and then here in Dallas, you, 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 you bring in the OU factor because there's so many OU right. people here. So, I mean, people were just absolutely – I mean, there was so much more excitement about a Tuesday night game against the Clippers than when the Heatles were here. It's not even close. Yeah. You know, the, the story on the jumping – so when he hurt his kneecap last year and they did the surgery, they he had 
they'd found like tendonitis or something in the knee, so they fixed that too. And he didn't realize he had it. It's just something he'd always played with. And once it healed, it, it was like they gave him like the, the shoes from like Mike. It was just he, his knees felt different. All of a sudden, he could do things that he couldn't quite do before. I mean, he still played pretty similar to what we're seeing now, but it just seems like he's jumping higher. You've got to get this team sold before he becomes a free agent. You got to make that your mission. I, I can't believe that's a story. I, I mean, I, I really like that's. First of all, it's four years away, and then second of well, all, well, it's a story only because. I mean, if Sterling is there, we know how it's going to end. So, I mean, no. that's why it's a story. I, I think there's a lot of people who want to see him stay there and would love to see him be the guy who actually makes that a real franchise and stays stays with the Clippers. But, I mean, are you going to marry yourself to Donald Sterling if you're him? Yeah. I, I mean, why even think about it until we know what the new collective bargaining agreement is? This new agreement might have franchise tags and all these protections because don't forget that Dan Gilbert, you know, is pretty involved in this stuff, and he is a living example of what can happen if you're not protected from your best player leaving. So I, I'm just... I'm not. I don't think it's a story until we figure out where everything goes. But I will say this: I, I've been to four, the last four Clipper home games, and then I went to the Laker game Tuesday night. And I know this is crazy, but there, there's more of a buzz for the Clipper games now. No, that's what I can't wait to see an All Star weekend. It's the Lakers. I mean, they the Lakers will be to, afterthoughts, all of them. Oh yeah, the Lakers to their fans, and they, you know, the love is still there, obviously, but it's it's now like a marriage of ten years where you see your wife, and you know, you you know what you're you, you've seen your wife in every conceivable outfit, et cetera, et cetera. Blake is like the new hot girlfriend, and there's just pe- people are going to these games, just you know, people are actually asking for my tickets. I've I've had to give away tickets for the last seven years. Now people, hey, can you, just wondering if you had any Clipper tickets available. So this guy. I, I don't think people realize what All Star Weekend is going to be like. I think it's going to be his breakout. Well, first we got to get through the coaches' vote, and it's pretty yeah. interesting with your boy Love, Griffin, yeah. Duncan. I mean, to me, that's where it all is. That triangle of guys is going to be. In, yeah, I, I think one way or the other, we're going to end up seeing all three of them. Yeah, I think so too. And I think your boy Dirk might be bowing out if he's not healthy, because it doesn't seem like he's healthy. Why would he play if he's not healthy? Probably wouldn't break his heart either. Yeah. These guys, he's got been 10 All-Star games. He still gets credit for being on the team. Mark Stein, we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Uh, and we'll read your weekend dime this weekend on ESPN.com. Looking forward to it. Thank you for the invite. Talk to you soon. All right, finally, we want to call my buddy House because uh, he's going to be joining us in Dallas next week for uh, a couple Super Bowl podcasts. He's going to be the, the mad dog to my mic, or the mic to my mad dog. Anyway, how's you there? What's happening? What is happening, as you would say? Yeah. You excited to do some live podcasts? You know what I'm excited to do? Flirt with Michelle Beadle. Ooh. She's going to that, be our first guest. That That's my, um, my second uh, priority. But my A number one priority, yeah. Texas barbecue. I know. That's why, it's one of the reasons we're bringing you, and you know, I'm going to, Probably going to bring a video camera to try to um, capture what's going to happen because I don't think the state of Texas is fully prepared. Uh, I, I, I will be prepared. Now, I just had Mark Stein on, and I, I gave him my theory that I think Texas should be separated in his own country. <laughs> he thought that was he thought that was insulting, and and I didn't mean it as an insult at all. Like, first of all, they dress differently. Second of all, the food. It's so much better than American food that it almost feels like we should pretend we're in another country when we're there. I just feel like they should have their own money. They have their own flag. <laughs> I just feel like it's funny that you call their food different. You, you, you say there's American food and then what? There's Texas food? Texas barbecue is unlike any food that we have in the United States. I'm sorry. Well, how about this? I have never um, set foot in any part of Texas other than the Houston airport. Wow. So this is this will be... I'm losing my Texas virginity. This is great. You know, for us, it's it's a storied, uh, it's been a, 20 years for us to get here. You know, you think back to us in college, we're in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, we both like to eat and play basketball and make fun of people, and those are the three things we have in common, so we become <laughs> friends. And there's this one barbecue place in Worcester called Fat Dickies, which is yes. no longer there, where you could just chow down for... 
I don't know, ten bucks or twelve. What was it? Was it like twelve bucks? I feel like the most expensive uh, platter on there was twelve bucks. And we would go down after we played basketball, and you would eat more than anybody who ever ate anything at Fat Dickies. You'd get like two entrees, but they were both like the the super mega Dicky platters. They were delicious. They were delicious, but they really weren't that delicious because it really was Worcester. It was a fast food chain. But to us, it was delicious because it yeah, was in the college, food in the dorms. That's it. So now, 20 years later, here we are in Dallas for the NBA All-Star, or for the Super Bowl, one of the yeah. great sporting events, um, and we're going to have real Texas barbecue. If you told me this 20 years ago, that we were going to be able to have a conversation with one another that would be recorded and then listened to by complete strangers about how much barbecue you were going to eat the following day in Texas. I think we would have taken that. I think we would have taken it. I'm sure we would have. I'm happy to be here. That makes two of us. It's going to be great. What do you, are you Now, walk me through, like, are you going to starve yourself in the week leading up to the whole thing, like Kobayashi? Like, what's your... No, no, I, I just, go in the other direction. Oh. I go for some, some big meals to make sure that I have room and that my body is... is in prime form to respond to what I want to put it through, right. and and then bounce right back. It just wants more. Okay. Yeah. So I go you, big. So you got to almost expand your stomach a little. That's bit. it. Now we're taping podcasts on Thursday and Friday in Dallas. Yeah. Who are the guests? Well, we don't know. We're still working on that. We're Great. gonna try. We're gonna actually try to have some real guests for once. Um, not that we don't have real guests, but guests that we wouldn't normally be able to get because they don't want to call in or. You know, people that, you know, Chris Collinsworth passing by and we grab him for 10 minutes. Hopefully that's fun. Yeah. It'll be a little different feeling for the BS report. But my question for you is, I don't want, I don't know if I want you overeating on Thursday and Friday (laughs) so that you're just in a food coma for these podcasts. I almost feel like we need to save it for Saturday. Okay. Well, it's up to you. You tell me what you're capable of. Well, no, I, 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 uh, I think that with the appropriate training, and then if I, you know, I hit all my marks this week running up to Thursday, yeah. uh, in terms of, of, you know, being in prime eating shape, that it ought not to get in the way of my performance during the day. <laughs> and I should be able to deliver exactly what the BS report needs out of me on Thursday and Friday. What was the, what dinner did we have where you went back to your hotel room and took off all your clothes and lay on the bathroom floor? That was in Portland, and I had a cold. Okay. That was but that, was, that, was, that was partly the food, though. It, it, it was definitely, definitely the food had a role, played a big role. See, you claimed you were sick, but you had, I think you had like 20 oysters, then you followed that up with a large clam chowder, yes. and then you had a surf and turf, and then there you was, had something else, too. There was a salad in there. Yeah, there was I a wedge, had, wedge salad. I had to get up and leave the table and go sit. You know, fortunately, <laughs> in this restaurant we went to, there was a phone booth that didn't have a phone in it. Yeah. It was a place for me to go sit quietly, though, <laughs> to catch my breath. There was something weird going on there. I, we were drinking. We had gone to the basketball game. We went to the, the Blazers-Pistons game. And you had then, some beers. I had some beers. And then we ordered Bloody Marys at the, at oh, the restaurant. Oh, that's what it was. It was the Bloody Mary after the beer, then followed by the fact that you ate 10 pounds of food. Yeah. There was some kind of gumbo. Oh, etouffee, I think I might have had. <laughs> that's, that's what it was. You ordered the etouffee. It was delicious. I remember that. I'm so mad that I didn't get a cell phone shot of you just sitting sitting in a phone booth with no phone in it. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been one for the ages. So then yeah. you went home that night, and then you sent us an email the next day that you went home, and you took off all your clothes and yeah. lay on the cold bathroom floor for like an hour. It was the only way to recover. I'm going to try to avoid that in Dallas. I would prefer not to be rendered, you know, catatonic by the, the by the food down there in, in Texas. Yeah, but on the flip side, you've never had barbecue like this. <laughs> well, maybe we'll get some pointers from some listeners and some readers about the, the appropriate way for me to, to, to strategize uh, tackling this. But I do want to be in tip-top shape for Thursday and Friday because it, it, we're going to see a lot of fun people. I don't want to be starstruck, mm. although Michelle Beadle, that's going to be tough. Yeah, we like Beadle. She's we a good like person, Beetle. too. Good people. Yeah. The, uh, well, your Twitter account, House from D.C. Yeah. If people want to tweet some suggestions for for barbecue places and things like that, let us know. I know there's one place we're going to go to. I don't want to give it away yet. But okay. 
I, a place that I had been to before. Oh, I, I think I tweeted about it once. It was out. It was like 20 minutes outside of Dallas, and it was like crazy. Like you, one of those places you could smell the smoke a mile away. Um, you know, from the from the barbecue, whatever the hell they do the make the ribs with. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be great. And I, we should, you know, what we might have to do is weigh you before and after. <laughs> is there a way to weigh yourself the night before you leave? Well, why don't we, uh, we maybe, maybe, the answer to that is yes, but maybe there'll be a scale in the hotel. So like I'll, as soon as I hit the ground there, and, and it would be best to use the same scale. Yeah. So it's an apples to apples comparison. Ooh, or I like should that. I say a brisket to brisket comparison? It's a great idea. Yeah. You know, maybe you could, you know, people tweet their weight when they're trying to lose, lose weight <laughs> and they tweet it every day to, to, as like a motivation for themselves. You should yeah. just do the opposite. I'll be tweeting my weight as as the running diary of of as a badge of pride. Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. I think we've estimated with some of these trips how much weight you've been able to put on over the course of like three four days, and it's usually about six seven pounds. Yeah, I think that's 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 probably in the cards for this trip. I think we get to ten. Oh no! Well, you know there is a lot of dense food in the barbecue uh, arena, mm. right? I mean that's yeah. it's heavy protein. Yeah, dense. I don't know. This pod's making me hungry. <laughs> I'm really starting to think. The best part of the barbecue is after you eat, it's still your hands still kind of stink of it. So if you put your you like wipe your lip or something, you still get that like after smoke taste on your lip. It's look. Uh, my my goal is to come home and 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 kiss my kid and for him to make a wrinkle face because, because you still smell like barbecue. Yeah, because I still smell like smoky barbecue. Joe Mead. Yes. On a scale of 1 to 10, how excited are you for House's eating performance in, in Dallas? As excited as I've been about anything in the last five years. Do you think it's more more or less exciting than Packers-Eagles? Probably more exciting. Yeah, because at least Packers-Eagles, there's a favorite, and I don't even know who's favored for House versus Texas Barbecue. What? You just said Packers-Eagles twice. I mean Packers-Steelers, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm old. I, I don't sleep. My, my son wakes you? up at 5.30. Yeah, no, it's um, true. So I would I would put a, te- a tentative line of Texas barbecue minus one and a half over house. I, I'm not even going to challenge that. I I probably take Texas barbecue as well. Like I say, you know, w- with me as a virgin, I'm pretty sure it's going to have its way with me. It's pretty. It's it's your biggest challenge since we had uh, March Madness last year, the Chick Fil A duel with with Sal. That you know, honestly, could have been a thirty for thirty episode. It just every time. Somebody was done. The other guy just pushed him to a higher place, and it, it was eventually a draw, right? Yeah, it was a draw. We split the last sandwich. We held it up together at yeah. the same time. The thing that was so brilliant about that was that it was unplanned. It just was a challenge that that you know came out of nowhere. Yeah, it was like in an all star game when just two guys start going head to head and trading yeah. baskets, and every the other eight guys just kind of step aside. <laughs> we were, everyone else in the room was the other eight guys. Yeah, we were we were trading nuggets. It's going to be great. Well, I might have to bring a video camera because this could really be the pilot for uh, the show we've always wanted to do called Beat the House. Or what was it called? Beat House House Record, Beat the House. Yeah, there were a lot of different names for it. Are you excited to be a co-host? Oh, I'm, I'm beside myself. Like I say, my main goal is to not um, get starstruck and, mm. you know, fall down in somebody's presence. Well, you mean at the parties or during the podcast? I'm definitely falling down at the parties. That goes without saying. <laughs> All right. So next week, Thursday and Friday, we're going to do two mega podcasts from Dallas. We're also, I'm also taping a couple other podcasts next week, but stay tuned for the first ever yeah. BS Report on location podcast. Joe Mead. Yes. We're sure this is going to work, right? It's going to work. We're actually in Fort Worth for that, lest we confuse everybody. But it's at Sundance Square on Thursday at 5 p.m. local time on the same set that they use for Mike and Mike, The Herd, and Sports Nation. Oh, so we have to go to Fort Worth to tape the Thursday one. That's right. And then Friday we're doing the one in Dallas at the Audi House. That's right. We're in that, that's definitely downtown Dallas, the second one. Yeah. Okay. So but Fort Worth, we're making a trip. We'll be there. This is going to be exciting. Look out, um, Texas! House from D.C. is coming to town! <laughs> It's good, and and the double Joes. It's a double yeah. cup of Joe. Anyway, fellas, 
Joe Mead, we'll talk to you on Monday with the Super Bowl Mega Playoff Podcast with the usual cast of characters. And then I think we're going to try to tape Chuck Klosterman on Wednesday. And then we're doing these mega podcasts Thursday and Friday. So dare I say this could end up being the greatest uh, week in BS Report history. As always, thank you for the support. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.